Everyone. So I'm sitting across from Elizabeth Monroe of the Flutie Foundation. Liz, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Tyler. Of course, I could not have you on. You're like one of our buddies. You're part of the family now at this point in time in school. So for the folks out there that do not know who the Flutie Foundation is, give me a little background. Sure. So the Flutie Foundation is a leading autism nonprofit in New England. We um, started 24 years ago. Doug and Laurie Flutie started the Flutie Foundation um, when their son, Dougie Jr., was diagnosed with autism when he was three years old. As many of you know, Doug Flutie is an NFL legend football player. And it's just he, an overall <laughs> football legend. Yes, is, so. <laughs> Boston legend, all of that. Um, so they really saw the struggles that families were having um, back then. There were no act. There was no services, no programs, no, no resources for families with autism. So they really decided that they wanted to make a change for other families um, experiencing what they were experiencing with Dougie and the Flutie Foundation began and we're going strong. We're actually entering our 25th anniversary in 2023, which is really exciting. That's, I was gonna say, talk about that before we get into like the event discussions. Tell me about just how exciting it is to, you know, for nonprofits to not only survive, but thrive for almost 25 years. Well, we are, psyched to go into our 25th anniversary is going to be a big blowout year really just a celebration of our people because that's truly what the foodie foundation is we celebrate our people our donors our sponsors the people and families that we serve our charity grant partners um, so it's really just going to be a celebration of our people and doug and laurie foodie are full, like so excited can't believe that this is happening like i'm sure when they started this 25 years ago they never thought that this is where we would be and we're just constantly changing the Flutie Foundation is constantly changing but we're staying true to who we are which is our mission of helping people and families affected by autism live life to the fullest I love it and uh, you know we've been able to see it firsthand at some of the events that we've worked with you on and you know that's where I want to take the conversation today but it, it, it is we walk out of every single one of your events thinking oh that was amazing not just the event itself but just what you do as a whole um, we love to see it it's just it's so cool to see and oh, to see all the to families kind of all come together and just support the mission, which is just awesome. <laughs> no other way to describe it, to be totally honest with you. It's heartwarming. So with that in mind, obviously this podcast is directed more towards folks that are planning and thinking about events as a, a whole, whether it's a small event or a large event. Now for you guys, we were introduced to you late last year in the, the fall last year for an upcoming winter event coming up. So I want to talk about the, the two events that we've worked together on. And I also want to pick your brand, some of the smaller events that you do throughout the course of the year. But tell me about, give me a little background on the first time we worked together. What event was that? Because that was a fun one. Sure. So the first event that we worked on together was the Flutie Foundation Holiday Spectacular live stream event. It was, <laughs> so we started our Flutie Foundation Holiday Spectacular during COVID actually. So in 2020, um, we streamed it entirely in-house. So it, we came up with the script, the overlays. We had to find a streaming platform ourselves. We really were just taking, I guess, like a Facebook or a social media Facebook live show and upping the ante, just making it a huge live stream. Um, so in 2021, we really decided that we were going all in. We wanted to go above and beyond, elevate our event more. We had a following, so we found you guys. We found Five Tool. It was awesome that you found <laughs> us, too. I remember it, it was a little bit late in the game. I think that <laughs> yes. we came together, but it was one of those things we were like, ah, oh, this mission's pretty awesome. And the event itself just sounded cool, all the things you were putting together. It was crazy when you came to us. I remember bringing it back to the rest of the team and we were thinking, how are we going to do this Great. in this yeah. amount of time? Like, how is this going to come together? And we're like, we'll figure it out. We'll find a way because your mission was the, one of the main reasons. We're like, we've got to get behind something like this. It was cool. Tell me about all the things that went on at this event because there were so many moving parts, but it made for a really cool show. While it was stressful for us in the back end, when I say us, I mean you, me, everybody else that's um, you know working on the event, the end users, they had a wonderful time. And that's all that matters when all is said and done. Right. So I guess at its core, <laughs> the event is a, hi it's a hybrid live stream. So um, we had an in-person studio audience at Flutie's Pub at Plain Ridge Park Casino. <laughs> and then we had in-person performers, in-person autism self-advocate hosts, and a small in-person studio audience of around like 100 people in Flutie's Pub in the casino, <laughs> which is literally, at, if you've never been there, it's directly in the middle of the casino floor. <laughs> it is in the heart of the casino floor. I mean, we were literally bringing our cameras, our switcher, the speakers, rolling it through the casino floor, bumping into folks that were playing slots, yes. right? <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it worked. But 
it was a different venue. But that's kind of brought the excitement because it was different in the same respect. Oh, definitely. Well, we had we knew we had to activate at Foodie's Pub. It's been around forever. It obviously is attached to Doug's name. And the pub wasn't open due to COVID. So it was just this empty space just sitting there. And we were like, we ha- this is our in-studio have to audience. leverage it. We have to do it. And then during the content of the show was really a mix of entertainment, fun, mission-centric good times, <laughs> which mm-hmm. included um, our sign- the announcement of our signature grant cycle. So in between live music performances, we had virtual guests. Doug and Lori Flutie were virtual guests. We announced our signature grant winners. So people were autism nonprofits were tuning in to see if they won a grant from the Flutie Foundation that would provide That's critical cool. funds for to support them in the next year. Um, so we had a lot of different audiences that we were catering to. We were catering to families, just entertaining viewers, obviously Doug fans. We always have Doug fans. You have plenty of Dougie fans, in. right? And then all of the autism self-advocates that we support, they're building their own fan base. So we have a choir of autism self-advocates mm-hmm. called Spectrum of Sound. They were in it. We have we had our new host, Jamie Pirro, who's now, she's now the host of like so She's many a regular things. and is yes. absolutely phenomenal. She brought her least. whole fan base. So again, like many audiences, but it was the primary audience was the live stream on YouTube. Mm-hmm. What was really cool about the way you approached the event was that more, you know, it's something that we talk about more often than not with folks, you know, turn it into a show. Don't just make it someone on stage talking at people for an hour about hear from this person. Let's hear from this person. Let's hear from this person. You had so many different moving elements in there. You know, let's hear from Doug and Lori remotely, which is a challenge having (laughs) anybody on remote always, but still there was a lot of moving parts that made it feel more like a, a variety show if you will. Like, you know, I, I think of, again, showing my age, gray hair, I get it. But when they used to have the, the old school variety shows that would come up, all right, now we're going to have someone come up and sing. Now we're going to have a putt challenge coming up on stage at the same time. But also, one of the things that we try now, we always talked about it with our clients, but no one truly understood it. But you did it on your own, and we now use it as the template. Say, see, here's what Flutie does. Here's what they did, and that's having the sideline reporter. And that was you, and I absolutely love that. So to set the scene, it was they have the regular stage, and then off to the side, you were giving updates with how things were going on the stream, how people were giving and donating. Tell me a little bit, well, like what went into that thought process of, we're going to do this because we now use it on everybody. We really? tell everybody to do it because we loved it so much. Awesome. Well, so we really just wanted to show the live viewers that, hey, like you're watching an actual live stream. So my job was to bring it back to the live. So I brought up comments that people were leaving in the chat. Um, people were able to donate um, on text to give and write in the chat. Mm-hmm. So I was giving live fundraising updates. Um, and just I, my position in the room was like, Literally, like when the camera was on me, you could tell we were in a casino. Yeah. So it brought it full circle. Like you're not just watching a stage. You're not just watching like a Zoom of Doug and Laurie. You're, this is a full live stream production mm-hmm. in the room with a studio audience. I love that. T- tell me, how important is it to have that engagement with the live audience, that are people that are watching remotely at home? Oh, God, it's so important. I'm sure as many of the listeners know, hybrid is where it's at, you can just engage with such a larger network of your supporters. It's not just the people in the room. And the best part of a hybrid event is that you can reuse that content later. So all of the pieces of the live event, we chopped up, we gave it to the people who were featured, we shared it on, it would just continued to be in our social strategy for the, like, the next months. And we're able to use it now as sponsor material, promotion material. It, it's all reusable and it's so valuable. I love that. I love that. You are literally speaking exactly what we try to tell everybody, but the fact that you're an organization that has done it um, speaks volumes to the way you all think at the foundation, which is just awesome to see. So you use that event. We'll go back to some of the things and lessons learned in a couple of minutes, which I know you and I can spend all day on that. But we'll go to, you know, how many months later? Seven months later. Um six, seven months later, you have your gala, which is another not exactly traditional venue that you'd go to, like a hotel ballroom. You have it in someone's backyard. And when I say someone's backyard, we're not talking about my backyard that has my kid's swing set right there. We're talking about a massive, gorgeous, pristine estate um, in Westwood. And tell me about this event, the gala, because you've had that a couple years in a row now, right? 
I believe this was our sixth or seventh year of hosting our annual gala. Okay. Previously, it was at TripAdvisor and then another um, venue in Boston. Mm -hmm. But during COVID, obviously, we shut down and did it I feel like so many things started (laughs) during COVID. (laughs) Yes, that's (laughs) when we really transformed as an organization, I feel. Um, But we switched to fully virtual. Again, like we were running it in-house. You should have seen us in our office. We were in our tiny office in Framingham. We didn't have the equipment to like understand. We didn't, well, firstly, we didn't fully understand the live production. And then we didn't have the equipment. So like we were all like, okay, no one talk for the next hour and a half. Like you cannot make a a peep because we don't know what input Mike is in. Like it's just like basic stuff. And so obviously after working with you guys for the Holiday Spectacular, it it was a no brainer to bring you on for our this year's gala. Um, and then this was our second year hosting it at this amazing house, thanks to our beautiful. generous donors, Absolutely um, our um, board members. Mm-hmm. And we ha- so we had it there the year pre- previously because of COVID, the restrictions, the public outdoor restrictions. We were literally toying with the, the capacity. So at one point, like a month before our gala in 2021, it was like, you can have 50 people in the backyard. And we were planning a backyard party for like 250 people. Oh my goodness, so we no were just way. teetering on the edge with all of the caterers and the event logistics, wow. which was crazy. So then last year obviously was much smoother because there were fewer restrictions. Um, but we it was just this giant tent in the backyard, mm-hmm. um, huge stage, beautiful decorations. Um, it was a party, awesome. musical party. I love it. and. Similar but different to what you did in at Plain Ridge Park Casino. Obviously, Plain Ridge Park was uh, you know a little bit smaller and more focused on the the at home viewer. Yes, this was a little bit more focused on the people in the room, right? Definitely. Our now, gala- what goes into that thought that thought process of like, no, we're focusing these people here versus at home? The metrics don't lie. So just yeah. um, finding out where our fundraising dollars were coming from, where are they coming from people bidding and donating online their phones or from the audience in the room and you could see the staggering difference our gala is for our dedicated audience in the room our top donors are in the room that night they know to come they know to save the date for our annual gala just because it's Mm. so special so the priority audience for our gala is in the room really cool that's awesome i love that i really do and uh, a success again this year right yes yeah I mean, it seemed it afterwards. I remember seeing walking out of it myself and thinking, that was amazing. I'm not looking at the numbers the way you are. I look at what happened, what went off where, and things like that. But for your side, was it a success? You know, having these events, how does this play into the fundraising strategy? Is it a, could you go without them, basically? Could you do it without it, your fundraising strategy? I know that's a loaded question. I'm going to say no. Events are key in our fundraising strategy every year just because they're key core elements that bring people together for a common cause and we are able to do what we do best which is have fun and be mission centric (laughs) so that's literally the core of our events and i would say that events have many levels so we're see like we have big core events like the flutie 5k for autism we're going into our 23rd year of that event that's never going to change it's only growing in different ways we're going national with that our gala whether that it's whether it's still a gala or not, it's just still such a core event. And then we have smaller events layered throughout the year where we still are finding ways to bring different groups of people together around our mission. And beyond that, <laughs> the Flutie Foundation is really passionate about our third party events. So people who go out and host events on their own to raise critical funds for the Flutie Foundation, Interesting. that's growing like crazy. Even through our, for example, our endurance program, with the Boston Marathon, those runners, they host their own events. Those, I would still consider those events. Even, like, they're still Flutie Foundation events. Because at the end of the day, it's <laughs> raising money for the mission, exactly. right? That's the, what the end goal is. That's really, I never actually even really thought about that, but it's true. They, those are Flutie Foundation events because it does benefit you at the end of the day, which is cool. So tell me, before we go into kind of your um, other event strategy, let's talk about some of the lessons you've learned from doing some of these big ones. I know we can make a list, right, and have some fun, but what are some of the key, if somebody was here that was thinking about starting an event, what are what are some of the things that you would tell them? What are some of the big key lessons that you've learned um, from planning some of these big ones specifically? Sure, well, number one, everyone test your Wi-Fi speed. <laughs> test your internet, right? Test you need it to at sure. all different times of the day, on all your devices, with people in the room, using the streaming platforms that you're going to use because 
well, you know, at our, <laughs> at our, t- what do you well, I think you, you've actually, well, what's funny is I think that you've actually been tainted not just from the event that we did together, but an event before that as well, making sure you're setting up, you know, hot spots all over the place, stringing them from the tops oh, of yes. tents, right? So internet, especially in those non-traditional venues is tough. Even in the traditional venues, internet is tough. Believe it or not, one of the easiest places to stream from are usually offices because it's business centric need that everybody needs internet whereas if you go to a in-person you know event space they're used to having people in person not the hybrid part but because the world is now flipped on its head they're starting to realize that however when we were at one specific location the internet was a little bit subpar i think we'd say right it yes. would be the easiest the nicest way to put it <laughs> right yes we were literally like in an event space where it was a cement box Mm -hmm. We were streaming in our key host, Doug and Laurie Flutie, Mm -hmm. through the internet, and it was just touch and go the entire event, and it was like, I don't know how you get (laughs) it. Yeah, but I think that the way to put it for the folks out there that might be trying to plan an event, like you said, testing everything, you know, months in advance. That way, the the days leading up to it, you're not scrambling trying to find, you know, band-aids and bubble gum trying to stick it, piece it together because that's only going to help. I remember we were trying to bring in external sources, you know, really the day before the event and um, uh, unfortunately to no avail at that point in time. We just couldn't get <laughs> things there fast enough to be totally honest with you. But I think that's one of a, an incredibly important is that internet for a hybrid event is probably one of the most important things that you can have. So make sure you have that way in advance and test the heck out of it right (laughs) what else what are some of the other takeaways that you've had um i would say staying true to your mission and who you are as an organization so like we know at the foodie foundation what we embrace like we embrace having fun celebrating our people um so just like staying true to that and not feeling the need to change because you you know who you are best Mm -hmm. um and you said it earlier, like what your audience expects of you, right? Your your audience, like you said, expects a party. They don't feel, doesn't seem like if you walked in and said this is a black tie optional sit down steak and rubber chicken dinner, they would be a little bit turned off from that versus, no, we're going to have some fun, right? <laughs> it just seems like we have you have a lot of flair there, which is fun. Exactly. And then going off of that too, just understanding, I'm sure there's metrics, don't quote me on this, but... Your audi- you may feel like you're repeating yourself so much, but you're not. Your audience, there's so much noise out there. Like, for example, we had our autism self-advocate host, Jamie Pirro. Mm-hmm. Her story, like, we were like, oh, my gosh, we've used, we, she's been a host for the, the Holly Spectacular. Now she's going to be the host for the gala. She won an award. But no, like, it's key to build that brand with your audience because they need to hear it over and over again. So even though it sounds redundant to you and your team, it's, so important for the external audience to hear. No, that's that's a huge point. I actually start to look at organizations and people, you know, they're your rock stars. Tell them, show them, right? I mean, uh, obviously the company's called Five Tool Productions, so I'm a baseball fan. There's no question about that. In baseball, you have your your Mike Trouts, your Ken Griffey Juniors, your big names. You know, obviously Ken Griffey Jr. is still being touted and being pushed amongst everybody because he was one of the biggest names in baseball. So Jamie is your rock star. Exactly. She's phenomenal. C. Quig is obviously your rock star, right? There are so many people in your wheelhouse that, well, you might say, all right, should we you know, change it up a little bit? No, people want to see them. They want to hear them because they're the rock stars, right? Exactly. I love it. I love it so much. That gets me so excited. I can't wait for this this winter's um, uh, gala. It's going to be just so much fun. It's yes. going to be another just great show, to say the least. So with that in mind, you know, we talk about the kind of lessons learned. Let's talk about some of the smaller events that you do. To talk about those, you know, when I say this, your 5K is huge. 5K is awesome. But talk about the some of the, the smaller events that you do. throughout. I remember after we wrapped up the gala, Nick literally said right after, yeah, we've got another event tomorrow night. I was like, what What are you talking about? You have another event tomorrow night. You do a lot of little and smaller events throughout the course of the year, don't you? Yeah, definitely. So I guess I'll start with our smaller live events. Sure. So this year we started a new live series called The Workshop. Mm-hmm. Um, we really wanted to cater to a LinkedIn audience because the show is about a two-way conversation between autism self-advocates and employ neurodiverse employers in the workforce so companies who are hiring an inclusive workforce which obviously fits linkedin so mm-hmm. our goal is to do like a l- one live show every month and so far we've stuck to that and that strategy ha- has been around finding co- 
finding employers that have cool locations. So like we were just at JVS in Boston. They have a mock CVS. They literally like have a, a room that it's set up like a CVS store, like stacked shelves and people with autism and other disabilities learn how to stock shelves, go to the cash registers and check people out. Like so cool, very visual for our live audience and super reusable content because it's, employment is such a big um, important topic in the autism community. We were at a movie theater once mm -hmm. for a. I watch all of them. Oh, okay. so I see all of them. I mean, the, the places that you go to, I'm like, how are they doing this right now? Who's what camera are they on? What? Oh god, it's it's so cool. No, we were the cameras. Something we're figuring out because sometimes we're on our phone. Sometimes we stream in a phone. Sometimes yeah. we use our camera. It's we don't. <laughs> we really need to Well, I know a guy. You. I can help you out. Before you leave, we'll, I'll send you away with some tips. So no problem. <laughs> yeah, so we have that live show. Um, and then we have other smaller events throughout the year, like you said. After mm -hmm. the gala, we, our people are all in town for our celebration. So we, we use our talent because they're there. Like We plan events around our other events because it makes sense for our mm -hmm. rock stars and our autism yeah. self-advocates, which is key. Um, yeah. I love that. That's that's. Amazing. I love it, to say the least. All right. So before, as we kind of close it up, wrap it up, what, advice to folks out there. I know we talked about a little bit before about testing the internet. How, what advice would you give to folks that are starting to, you know, plan an event? You know, where do they start? What do, where do you start, really? Um, so we start with really our, I would say, like our marketing calendar, mm -hmm. our, our communications calendar, our fundraising calendar, where we have room for key initiatives so like obviously like 45k fall like it fits into our calendar so just really working with your organization's overall strategy to figure that out but uh, <laughs> regarding like planning um how far out do you plan oh god when do you start <laughs> not far plan, enough so never know. right <laughs> no there's never enough time and i guess not to say that you don't need a lot of time to plan because you do but know know your assets and know that you can pull it together if you need to because if you have true identity of your organization, your strengths, and what is at your disposal for resources. Like, I don't know, like when we pulled you in for the Holiday Spectacular the first time, that was us starting to plan the event. But like, we, we, you have an idea, we have the yeah. vision, we, we, and we're lucky that our, um, the executive director of the Foodie Foundation, Nick Savarese, is so, he's such a visionary leader mm -hmm. that the pieces fit in. Like the, the crazy vision is out there, it exists. It's just, we just have to execute it. Yeah, I was gonna say. I think Nick even mentioned it to me one time. It's like it's organized chaos. We have to have a little bit of fun with this, oh, right? Yeah. And that's the, the spontaneity of it. Is exactly. what makes people want to watch and tune in for those those hidden gem moments that you really never know are gonna happen. But that's what everybody ends up talking about when all is said and done, which is fun. Yeah, you gotta the, change it up. Gotta the, keep it live. One thing I will ask you this before we wrap it up is, is you know themes because you guys you know look and feel. How do you come up with the themes uh, of some of your events? Because I, I've always loved you know when you've we first started talking, say, here's kind of our branding for this event. Here's what we're going off. And the same thing, you know, it was kind of a, a black and gold was the, uh, the kind of the theme and color scheme. How, where does that come from? Where does that start? Um, so it really starts with the program, the, the autism self-advocates and the people in our program. So this past gala, it was all about elevating the voices of people with autism and we had a choir we had so many singers we had a rapper we had first ever musical mc stefano mccauley which was like mm -hmm. uh, like picture jimmy fallon like he was the roots like, yeah that was the roots exactly yeah he was i was gonna say he was quest love when yeah. coming bringing people up yeah so we fully just because we had all that star power we fully embraced the like rock and roll theme we had as soon as you walked into our gala there was like a, a wall of stars like you could see mm -hmm. them they were all outlined so i guess they really drive the theme because it's our intention to continue elevating their voices and sharing people's stories with autism. Awesome, I love it. It's a, it's a star-driven community. I love it, it's so cool. Well, Liz, thanks so much for taking your time. Head thanks down here and me. talk with us, really appreciate it. Of that. course, looking forward to the next event. I was gonna say, we'll have some fun. All right, she's Elizabeth Monroe, I'm Tyler Pyron from Five Tool Productions. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.